well, it's good to speak to the campus man this afternoon. You know, it is, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to address the mighty man of the LA Church Campus Ministry. You know, you know that it's gonna be a good service when there's an incredible welcome. Man, Nick Clyde, he came up here and he was preaching so good. And I was like, you know, I don't even need to get up and preach the word today. But it's okay, because God called me to preach and I'm gonna preach to my brothers, amen? The title that I've been given today is The Righteous Are As Bold As a Lion. Come on, nice. And that's based off of Proverbs 28, verse 1. You know, what I found is that a lion, it symbolizes fearlessness. Nice. A lion symbolizes strength and invincibility. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so incredible to know that the Bible in the Old Testament mentions a lion 155 times. But I thought to myself, I said, you know, what makes a lion so confident? Tell us, bro. Come on. Woo! Well, let me, let me give you a little, little synopsis of what makes a lion confident. A lion has 18, almost two-inch claws. It has two-inch canines. It has incredible vision, eight times better than humans. And it has enormous leg strength. This is the weaponry of a lion. You know, I believe there's three things as disciples that we need in our life to be bold like a lion. I believe there's three weapons that we need to crank out our campus ministries in 2019. I believe the weapons that we need in this room today is you got to understand who you are, your identity. You need to understand that your strength comes from the Holy Spirit. And you have to, have to, you must have faith. Point number one, a false identity equals a false reality. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 13. Come on, bro. Come on, Aaron. Come on, Aaron. Come on, bro. Come on. Come on, bro. Let's go, Aaron. Let's go, Aaron. Let's go, Aaron. In Numbers chapter 13, Let's go, bro. We're with you. when I get there, <laughs> but before I get there, okay. let me get some water. My voice is dying already. <laughs> I just got through a, a sore throat, so someone threw my tea away. I, I had to pray to get my heart right a little bit. You know, when you think about identity, you think about the very thing that propels you to show who you are mm -hmm. as a disciple. You know, there's a quote by James Baldwin. Come on. And it says, an identity would seem to be arrived at by the way in which the person faces and uses his experience. Mm -hmm. ah. You know, what that reveals for us is that as disciples, if we do not know who we are in Jesus, you cannot do the very things that God has called you to do. Let's pick it up in Numbers chapter 13. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. In Numbers chapter 13, give you guys a little context. God comes to Moses and he tells Moses, hey, I want you to send out some spies. Spy out this land, the Canaan land, the land in which I will give to you and your family. So Moses, he goes out. He, he sends the spies and they come to this land and it's filled with milk and honey. It's everything that they could wish and imagine. Right. Nice. Right. But we're gonna check it out and see what happened when the spies came back and reported. Oh, on, Let's pick it up in verse 31. Right, in verse 31 it says, but the man who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They are stronger than when we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. They said the land we explore devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, and, came and come from Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Wow. Chapter 14. Wow. That night, all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. 
All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in the desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall to the sword? Our wives and our children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. What do we see? We see that the spies, they come back and they give a negative report. They come back and say, hey, we cannot take this land for there are giants there. And it says in our own eyes, we look like grasshoppers. And when I thought about this, I was like, man, the people, they caught grasshopper syndrome. <laughs> they got grasshopper syndrome. Well, you may be asking, Aaron, what is grasshopper syndrome? Grasshopper syndrome is what keeps you from laying hold of what God has given you because you have failed to believe who you are in your identity with Christ. You start to view yourself as this mini, insignificant little thing that can wow. do nothing. But you are a child of God. Yeah. But we also see here in, in chapter 14 that there's some symptoms that you can tell when someone has grasshopper syndrome. Come on, bro. Oh, yeah. The first thing we see is discouragement. Yeah. They're crying. They're sad. Oh, my gosh. Why did God bring us out here? But then there's grumbling. They start to exaggerate their situation. They start to go and say, you know what? It was better for us to be in Egypt. We should have just stayed there. God just delivered you out of slavery. Isn't that how we can be sometimes when we forget our identity in Christ? We forget who we are, what we've been forgiven of, and then what do we do? Man, I don't want to be a disciple anymore. I don't, I just, I'm faithless. I can't, I can't be fruitful anymore yeah. and yet the leaders in this group spread this grasshopper syndrome all throughout the camp wow. Wow. what do we learn we learned that as a leader as the men of the campus ministry if you do not understand who your identity is in christ you will spread like a wildfire wow. the faithlessness within your group yeah. you know i thought about the grasshoppers in this, in this scenario. And I couldn't help but think of a time when I was younger. And I used to do a lot of yard work outside and we used to have these, these big old grasshoppers, green ones, brown ones. And I just remember chasing these things and they would just jump up and fly and, and literally disappear in thin air. But what I noticed is that the grasshopper, they have camouflage. And so when they, when they go on the wall of the tree, they, they totally disappear right. from human sight. Yeah. And I thought, oh my goodness, as men, we can be grasshoppers. Yeah. Some of us in these chairs right now are grasshoppers. Oh. Some, of us, some of us are like, you know what, you're not going to see me. <laughs> and you just disappear. Where is so-and-so? He's the next Bible talk. Oh, he didn't disappear. He, he doesn't want to answer the call. But as the man of the campus ministry, do you see who God has called you to be? Let's turn our Bibles to Judges chapter 6. You know, I... I'm sorry, but I just want to look at the bad examples in the Bible. Because I think sometimes we, we just always look for the inspiring accounts in the scriptures to help us to be like, yes, I'm going to do that. But you need to see where you're really at sometimes so that you can make a change in your life. Let's look at Judges chapter 6. We're going to look at the story of Gideon. Now, Gideon... Gideon was one of the judges, as we're going to find out. But at this time, Israel was being ravished by the Midianites and all these surrounding people. And, and they've, they've turned their back on God. And in doing so, they, they received so much punishment from these foreign people that they, that they begged God, God, please save us. 
Save us from ourselves. And so then God comes to, to Gideon to help save his people. We'll pick it up in verse 11. In verse 11, oh, excuse me. In verse 11, it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Evazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a winepress to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Wow. But, sir, Gideon replied, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Were all of these wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not, am I not sending you? But Lord... Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. Gideon replied, if, not, if now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it is really you talking. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went and prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour he made bread without yeast. Putting the wheat in a basket and his broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. With the tip of the staff, that was in his hand, the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, O oh, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. We'll stop right there. God calls Gideon. He sends him an angel. And he says, I want you to save my people, mighty warrior. What does Gideon do? How does Gideon respond? But sir, but Lord, he makes all of these excuses why he could not save the people. But as you go on and you read throughout the chapter in chapter 6 and chapter 7, you guys can write these down. In verse 39 through 40, Gideon, he goes and he requests to, to, to lay down a fleece to make sure that he's truly being called by God. Yeah. After he's already, God's already burnt up the offering. Right. That was his first sign. Right. And then he goes for a second, but then he goes for a third. Wow. And then a fourth. Wow. In chapter 7, verse 10, God even comes to him. He says, hey, if you're still afraid, go ahead and go down to the Midianite camp. There's a guy there. There's some guys talking. I gave them a dream that they're going to lose to you. And they, they will fall in your hands. If you're so afraid, go down, take your servant, and you'll hear that. So Gideon, he gets up, and he goes down to hear this dream. He still doesn't believe that God had called him. You see, what do we see from Gideon? We see a desperate grasp of security. He wanted to truly make sure that God truly called him. And God is a merciful God. Man, if I was God right here, I'd have been like, I'm choosing somebody else. Right. <laughs> I'm over here giving my heart, chosen you, the least of the of the, the Manasseh tribe, and you still don't believe me. And yet I believe this is the way we act sometimes yeah. when we're on our campuses. Yeah. When God has called you to just be a disciple, not to be a Bible talk leader, not to be an evangelist, but just to be a son of God. And to preach the word, he says, go, I have called you mighty warrior. I couldn't help but think of the Matrix. Right. How many of you guys like the Matrix? Yeah. I love the Matrix. Let's go, bro. One of the scenes in the Matrix I love is the dojo fight with oh, Morpheus. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I always think, like, man, God is Morpheus and I'm Neo. And I, I want to read you guys... Their, their little dialogue of what they're talking about right here 
in this dojo fight. Morpheus, he comes up to Neo. They, they plug into the Matrix. They're programmed. They know all the Kung Fu and all that. And Morpheus, he says, this is a sparring program, similar to the program reality of the Matrix. It is a set of basic of rules, rules of gravity. What you must learn is that these rules are now different from the rules of the computer system. Some of them can be bent, others can be broken, understand? Then hit me if you can. Morpheus, good, adaptation, improvisation, but your weakness is your technique. They keep fighting. Morpheus wins, knocks him down. Morpheus comes back and he says, how did I beat you? Neo says, you're too fast. But Morpheus goes, do you believe that me being faster or stronger has anything to do with my muscles in this program? Do you think that it is the air that we are breathing, breathing again? And so he calls Neo, he says, we're gonna fight again. Morpheus answers back, what are you waiting for? You're faster than this. Don't think you are, know you are. Neo's hits finally hit Morpheus. Neo says, I know what you're trying to do. Morpheus says, I'm trying to free your mind, Neo, but I can only show you the door. You are the one that has to go through it. Wow. And every time I, I, I read that and I see it in the movie, it inspires me because it is the very thing that God does. God will give you everything you need to show you who you are, but only you need to walk through the door. Only you need to know that it is through his power and his grace and his might that you can accomplish what he's called you to do. You know, Romans 8.37 says, you are more than a conqueror. 1 Peter 2.9 says, you are a royal priesthood. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's workmanship. John 1.12 says, you are a child of God. John 15, 15 says, you are a friend of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, you are brand new and a new creation. Come on, come on. I got to ask you today, do you believe all those scriptures? Oh, wow. come on. Mm. Do you believe in God's word? Because if you truly say you believe in God's word, you're going to believe every single scripture I just read off. God has called us to be freedom fighters. God has called us to go on our campuses and just be bold and courageous for the Lord. Amen. 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 Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Point number two. The second weapon that you need to be bold and courageous this year okay. is the spirit emboldens the righteous. Yes. You see, true biblical boldness is actually acting upon the Holy Spirit, as we're going to wow. see right here. And in verse 5, the Bible reads, The next day the rulers, elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. And I, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other man of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name do you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of, the Nazareth, of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no one, no other name under heaven given to man by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage, the boldness of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled ordinary men, they were astonished and they note they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then confer together. We'll stop there. We see the apostles, they get arrested for preaching the gospel right here. But in verse 8, it says, as they questioned them, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. 
Has there been a time when you just felt filled with the Holy Spirit and you just preached the word to somebody on campus? But we see that the apostles, there was bold proclamation. You know this because Peter, he goes and he says, salvation is found in no one else. Peter had no problem telling people they were lost. Do you struggle with telling people they're lost in a discipleship study? Do you struggle in Allen D when you're, you're trying to help that religious person to say, hey, you are actually in the dark and not the light. Let's, let's just let's put that out there right now before we go any further in the study. Are you afraid? Are you sentimental to proclaim the truth? Because that is what true boldness is, guys. I think we have a misconception of what boldness is. Boldness isn't just being loud. Boldness isn't just being rude. Boldness is not being confrontational and just rude. Boldness is actually proclaiming what is true. That is what true boldness is. And yet we live in a time on our campuses that the status quo is that Jesus is not the way. We, we live in this status quo that, man, there's so many other ways to God than through Jesus. But are you willing to stand up and preach the truth in boldness? You know, the, the scripture teaches us that when they heard the apostles talk, they knew they had walked with Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was a powerful guy. When Jesus walked in the room, oh, everybody was like, oh, Jesus is here. <clears throat> How you doing, Jesus? <laughs> but we understand from this passage that it wasn't the apostles that had this boldness. It was the Holy Spirit. In verse 8 through 12, the Spirit allowed them to accomplish something they could not do on their own. You see, you can't be fruitful on campus by yourself. You can't preach the word by yourself. You can't disciple people by yourself. You need the Spirit. You need that Holy let's Spirit. Go, bro. Yeah, come on, bro. But let, let's also understand where we connect with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, let's jump to right, verse 29. Come on, I'm sorry, 27. Let's go, bro. It says, Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you've anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Come on, Aaron. Come on. The apostles had such a deep prayer. Like, this, is, this is one of the things that I feel like I've learned in 2018 and coming into 2019 from our brother John. John, man, this guy prays. I remember he would call me. Bro, I prayed for it. I prayed an hour for you this right. morning. I said, oh my goodness, I'm convicted. <laughs> what? He prayed an hour just for me? Like, this guy's prayer life is so incredible. And it inspired me to go deeper, to connect with this Holy Spirit so that I can have the same power on, bro, that I see in my brother John, my father in the faith. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. You got to ask for the boldness. You know, I love it because it says, as they pray, they ask God, man, stretch out your hand, heal, and perform miraculous signs. See, you're going to see miraculous signs through you when you pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon you and preach the word. You know, what I found is that prayer needs to be the center of your life. I think a lot of times we, we look at, if you were to put this on a pie chart, as a disciple, and prayer is one of those little pieces right. of, of, of the pie. You got your evangelism, you got your, you got your, your, your prayer slice, you know, you got your, your kingdom date slice, you got your midweek slice, you got all these different pieces in the pie, and prayer is one of those pieces, but no, prayer needs to be the center wow. of that pie. You know, being fruitful isn't that complicated if you tap into the Holy Spirit. Mm. And I, I, I look at our campus ministry, I look at these rows in the back, and, and I'm like, man, where are all these other brothers? Where are all the other future brothers in, that are going to be sitting here hearing the word of God preached? It's going to take you tapping into the Holy Spirit to fill up this room. Next year, I don't want to be in this room. I, I, I want to be in one of those big rooms we were in this morning. That's what a campus ministry needs to be, amen? Yeah. 
turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 7, it says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. You know, this is a scripture my father actually made me memorize. Because I was a little scaredy cat. I was scared of the dark. We have roaches in the house. You turn on the light, woof, roaches going everywhere, hitting your feet. I was scared to go downstairs. Downstairs. So my dad, he's like, I want you, boy, you, you better not come up here scared like that. You need to memorize this scripture. And I memorized the, the King James Version, version which is, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind and self-control. And I, and I thought about this. I was like, man, the spirit has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power and love. And it's not my, I thought of Galatians 5.22, the fruits of the spirit. Wow. We see that the spirit enables you to what? Have love. Right. And right here in the scripture, it teaches us that there is love through power. Power comes from love. Yeah. And when I thought about this, I was like, you know what? This is why Jesus was so bold. Because he was propelled by love. And the Greek word, the love right here is agape, which we know is unconditional love. And so love takes risk. Jesus took a risk. Jesus put himself out there so that each and every one of us can have a relationship with him. So we need not be afraid. Because we love God so much that it should be the very thing that propels us to do great things for God. You know, and I thought about that. I thought, I love animals. And I couldn't help but think about this, this one National Geographic scene I saw with a mother, two mother bears, grizzly mother bears. Now, if you guys know a little bit about bears, grizzlies, mother grizzlies in particular, are very aggressive. They will not let anything come near their cubs. Now, what male grizzlies tend to do is kill off their cubs so that the mother can come up and, and uh, be in heat again so that it can mate with the mother. I saw this video, and these two mothers, one of the mothers takes the cubs up this sheer cliff. The other cubs go up. The other mother's cubs go up with it. This other one comes down and starts bulldozing this giant male grizzly. Now, this, grill, this uh, male grizzly has the power and the ability to kill this female grizzly right here. They're way smaller. And I thought, man, this mother was driven and was bold because of her cubs were in danger. Is that the way you view people on your campus? Do you see people on your campus is, is, is being attacked and just torn apart by Satan? Because if you don't, you don't have that power of love that the Spirit has called to you, for you to follow and, and, and to overcome in your life. Turn me to Luke chapter 4. You know, in Luke chapter 4, we're going to look at Jesus and how the spirit impacted him and how it drove him on, to save the lost. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, in Luke chapter 3, 21, Jesus, he comes, he prays, and it shows us that heaven opens up and the Holy Spirit descends on him. But then in Luke 4, in verse 1, it says that Jesus comes full of the Holy Spirit. And we'll pick it up in verse 14. And it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the spirit. And news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogue, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as with his custom. And he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight of the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Then everyone's eyes in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Man, it, it takes a bold dude to come in a synagogue it says, I am this scripture, full of the Holy Spirit. And he goes and, he, and he, has, he has the audacity to say, hey, this is what the prophets were talking about was me. Wow. You know, do you, do you feel the Holy Spirit when you go and you just preach 
to the people on the campus? Come on, bro. Do you just get the, the passion and, and, and the understanding that it's a global epidemic of sin running rapid on these campuses? Yep. <clears throat> you know, I, I can't help but think about how Jesus felt when he read that scripture. Jesus must have felt so empowered to know that God had chosen him that the spirit itself was the very source of his power. And I, and I think, guys, we need to take it to another level in our connection with God. Come on, bro. We need come to on. really tap in to the spirit and have a deeper prayer life. Man, come, on, nice. come on, bro. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Uh, I'm, I'm running out of time. Time to speed up. Come on, bro. In Luke come chapter on, 7, Keep it coming, bro. Come on, bro. and my third point is great faith determines your bold state. Mm. Great faith determines your bold state. Come on, bro. In Luke chapter 7, we're going to take a look at the centurion. I just want to give you guys a, a lot of examples, because I think we need a lot of examples today, man. Yeah. And in Luke chapter 7, this, this, this centurion, he comes, and, and he just tells, hey, send this person to go tell Jesus to heal my servant who I dearly love. But this guy's faith is so remarkable as we'll, we'll pick it up right here in verse 6. In verse 6, it says, He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to him. Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I do not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under, under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Then the man who had been has sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Jesus was impressed by the centurion's faith. And what we learn from this is that the centurion says, hey, just tell Jesus to say the word, and I believe it's going to come true. Wow. See, all we need, guys, is the scriptures. Yeah. When the scriptures tell you just remain in the vine, you will be fruitful. But you got to believe it. But this guy was bold because you go to Jesus and you, you, you would think you would come to him personally and say, hey, Jesus, I know you can do this. Can you do this? He's like, no, I believe Jesus can do this. Let me send some servants and I know it's going to get done. That's even bolder than coming to Jesus in his face and telling him, I know you can do it. This, this guy had great faith. You see, a, a, a retreating faith is a fatal mistake. A retreat in faith is a fatal mistake. Come on. And I think a lot of times we, we tend to back down in our faith. We don't see the things that we want to see happen right away, so we get faithless. Nice. You know, when I, when I read this, I thought about when I first became a disciple. And I remember I was just so full of faith. I just, I believe if I got on my knees and I just prayed, man, it was going to happen. Right. And I didn't care when it was. I just knew it was going to happen. And I remember that first couple months of me being a disciple, I remember baptizing two people in one day, multiple times, on multiple occasions. And I was thinking about this yesterday, and I was like, dude, what happened to me? What the heck happened to me? Now, I've been fruitful since then, but not like that. My, I saw my mom get baptized. I saw my, my football players get baptized. I seen so many people come to God because I just had the faith that God was going to work through me. Right. Mm -hmm. wow, wow, wow. And I was, I was thinking about this, and I was pondering. I was like, you know what? I got to get back to that bold faith, go, that great right. faith. And I challenged myself this year. I said, I'm going to be the most fruitful that I've ever been, even before I was a baby disciple. Amen. <laughs> I was like, those days aren't over. They're not over. I'm going to make the stand that I'm going to be just as bold as I was when I was a young disciple. A couple months old spiritually. And we got to know that faith fuels our boldness. 
If you don't believe that faith fuels your boldness, you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. And I think, guys, I want to challenge us with this acronym. And it's called AWE. A-W-E. Ask, wait, and expect. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I want us to be men that ask, wait, and expect God to do incredible things in 2019. Amen. You know, Mike, this on, guy named y uh, Mike Yakansali once said, boldness doesn't mean rude, obnoxious, loud, or disrespectful. Being bold is being firm, sure, confident, yep. fearless, daring, strong, resilient, and not easily intimidated. It means you're willing to go where you've never been, willing to try what you've never tried, and willing to trust what you've never trusted. Boldness is quiet, not noisy. And I, I, I want to leave us today believing that. I want us to leave here believing who are, we are in Christ Jesus. I want us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I want us to have great faith that propels our bold state, amen, and to God be the glory.